The Ray Hanania Show is brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News Newspaper, the Middle East's leading English language publication with print and online editions in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, France, Japan, Pakistan, England, and the United States. Listen to live radio every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and Ontario, Canada. Or watch the live broadcast on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. The Ray Hanania Show is rebroadcast in Chicago at 12 noon on Thursday. For more information on the radio stations, live Facebook broadcast, and podcasts, visit ArabNews.com. And now, here's your host, columnist and U.S. special correspondent for Arab News, Ray Hanania. And it's Wednesday, April 27, 2022, and I am your host, Ray Hanania. April is an important month to Arab Americans. It's uh, ending the uh, month of Arab American Heritage Month. Uh, We also just finished celebrating the traditional Easter uh, about two weeks ago and Orthodox Easter this past Sunday, um, and Passover ended uh, this past week, and we're also approaching the end of Ramadan. Um, Eid Mubarak to our Muslim friends who are fasting and commemorating this important religious holiday in Islam. We're broadcasting in Detroit, Washington, D.C., Canada. And tomorrow, Thursday, we rebroadcast the show in Chicago at 12 noon on WNWI AM 1080 radio. Today, our topics, really interesting stuff. Segment one, we're going to be talking about uh, President Biden. He's probably done more to include Arab Americans than I've ever seen any prior president do. And uh, we're going to talk about where he gets his information on Arab Americans with the chair and deputy chair of a very important organization called the Arab American Affinity Group, which is part of the State Department with Nadia Farah and Mahmoud Al Hamalawi. In segment two, at the bottom of the hour, we're going to look at the challenges facing Coptic Christians of Egypt with author Abdul Latif El Manawi and discuss his deep dive this week on Coptic Christians with Arab News journalist Jonathan Gornal. So let me welcome uh, Mahmoud and Nadia to the program. Welcome, you guys. Nadia serves as the special assistant to Deputy Secretary Sherman, covering the Middle East and North Africa, counterterrorism, and cyber issues. Um, and uh, she entered civil service in 2011 as a presidential management fellow. Uh, Mahmoud El Hamalawi is a press officer in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs covering North Africa and previously served as an outreach officer under the GPA's National Media Outreach, outreach Unit advising and staffing press engagements. Um, he was a senior news producer who was covering breaking news and stories out of Washington, D.C., and uh, addressing the global impact. The Arab Americans and Foreign Affairs Agency Employee Affinity Group. You know, it's amazing governments have these long names, don't they? I don't know how you remember all those words for a title, uh, Mahmoud, but uh, it is amazing. All right, here we go. Let me uh, get uh, Nadia in there. All right, we'll get Nadia on there. And uh, this is this is an important group. Nadia, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Hi, Nadia. Hi. How uh, are you? How are you? Thank you. I have you and uh, Mahmoud on, and I just got through introducing you. Thank you. Bo- First of all, thank you both for joining me. Um, I I was just saying at the beginning of the program how I felt that President Biden has done more to outreach for to Arab Americans than any other past president. And, you know, politics is a back and forth criticism, support, criticism, support with the media. But I was interested in understanding the foreign affairs agencies, employee affinity groups that the State Department has. I never realized that they existed. And maybe tell us, first of all, what it is and uh, how does it work? What role do you guys play? Sure, I can uh, I can take that. Um, so there are several different, now we call them employee organizations. Um, there are ones that are 
divided amongst like different heritages, ethnicities, you could say. So there's a Asian American group, Hispanic, uh, there's a Thursday lunch group, uh, Blacks in government. There's also um, other groups focused on how you entered the government. There's a civil service group. There's of course our um, Wrangle and Pickering Fellows, which are uh, kind of an initiative to bring in more diverse candidates into the State Department. There's also a group uh, for uh, those uh, employees who have disabilities and the LGBTI plus community. And the role of these groups is to kind of advocate one for their membership, but to also be advisors to our leadership on kind of how to reach the goal we are, which is to make us State Department or federal government look more like America, and um, how to do that within these communities, how to do outreach, how to do recruitment, how to keep retention, and just monitor kind of the community's needs for our leadership. And how long has this, uh, the Arab affinity group been in existence? Has it been a long time or since the beginning of the affinity groups? Yeah, um, so it's not the oldest by any means, but we're also not the newest. And uh, we were started in 2014. Uh, what makes us a bit more unique than other groups is that we span all foreign affairs agencies. So we're not just a State Department group. We have members from Treasury, from uh, Energy. So all over the interagency, we have about we have over 500 members. So we've really grown in the last couple of years. Wow, the very- Arab the Arab affinity affinity group has over 500 members. But you don't have to be Arab or Arab uh, American. Oh, correct. You-, you have to have an interest in it. So it might yeah. be people in the agency that deals with the Middle East that might be part of it. How much- right. or like the language or the culture or just want to work on diversity and inclusion issues. And, and uh, Mahmoud, you're also part of this. So I want you both to feel free to talk. I'm, this is not a gotcha, you know, uh, segment. I really, it's fascinating to me that Arab Americans have this impact um, that we don't often see. I haven't seen any stories about it. Now, I, um, I think it's, um, I think it's been really uh, interesting. So thank you for reaching out. And I dealt with you when I was uh, arranging these interviews for the Secretary of State. And what's interesting about these uh, or such- Give me an interview with the Secretary of State, would you please? I'm a nice boy, I promise, okay? 45 years of journalism, I'll, I'll be nice. But that's actually a great segue. What the department did is they sought me and got my experience from TV, right? Uh, when I used to work at Al Jazeera. And right. I, here I am at the State Department. Now I work for the Department of Near Eastern Affairs. And I, I wanted that, and I, uh, and, and I very much appreciate that opportunity. But I think also as members, we appreciate the fact that the department itself uh, looks at us as, as a resource, uh, not necessarily on, 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 on policy per se, but to get our perspectives on issues such as diversity and inclusion, all the various groups that Nadia referred to, whether it's um, individual who, uh, individuals from, from from South America, from Asia, or uh, Blacks in government, and those individuals, Arab Americans ourselves, now the department reaches out to us for events and initiatives such as National Arab American Heritage Month. So they too are utilizing us as, as, as a resource. So we do encourage uh, individuals to have that collective uh, at, at their agency, at their employment uh, location, if they're interested in doing so. And definitely through our organization, we try to open that up for all individuals that happen to work in federal government agencies. Now, it happens that the two of you have pretty big titles. Uh, Nadia is the special assistant to Deputy Secretary Sherman covering Middle East and North Africa, counterterrorism and cyber issues. So if you want to create news, obviously, to help me out, that would be great. But um, and then uh, Mahmoud El Hamalawi is a press officer in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs covering North Africa. Um, do you guys deal obviously you have responsibilities in those agencies correct and then in addition is it like a double not a double burden but a double responsibility to also then look at the u.s and make sure that the arab community the affinity group that you represent is engaged with the administration right I, that's a really good question and I, secretary blinken talks about this he does like monthly engagements with each um Uh, employee organization and he says you do this on top of your regular work so Mahmoud and I have like full day schedules right Um, but 
uh, we're very, I, for me, I'm very supported by my leadership to do work on diversity and inclusion. And it is on top of all of my other work. And April has been an exhausting month, but for good reason. Uh, and I will say, you know, it used to be us kind of pushing out information on our heritage, on our um, contributions to the U.S. government. But more and more we're seeing those who don't um those who don't come from like these underrepresented communities really be allies and like push for us and i've had people create like quizzes on arab american heritage or put out tweets on this that have nothing to do with our community so there is a lot more work on us but we have a bigger community now at the department and overall in government like helping us uh, get the word out on our contributions and how we want to move forward. Now, it must be difficult because, um, you know, the Arab community in the United States, we do not have a very large media. You know, we had a journalism association a number of years ago. We, we counted 102 publications before September 11th. Um, since then, we've, we have less than like 60 Arab American publications one weekly in Detroit, the Arab American News, as you probably know, um, this radio station now, you know, one hour every week um, mm -hmm. with uh, special segments during the week. There's just not a lot of us. Do you focus mainly when you deal with the media and getting issues out? Do you focus mainly with the Arab world media or do you also try to include the Arab American media? Either one. Uh this Sorry, way. I, can, I can try to take that. I one. know I it's rough being it. with the boss, you know, the chairman, and you're the deputy chairman, okay? Well, I'm the communications Don't worry, you're not uh, gonna get officer, mad. so it's quite all right. So I'm the communications <laughs> officer for, I know, for the joking. organization, so no, quite quite all right. I think what we want to do, uh, as Nadia said, we have our full-time job, so this is a complete volunteer effort that we are quite proud and privileged to be able to do uh, on behalf and for, for, for the government in terms of diversity and pushing for our cause and helping our colleagues network and helping them set up for career opportunities, mentorship, uh, connect and have those excellent opportunities so they can serve that higher purpose and get into policy or, or what, what have you. Uh, but be, beyond that, I think our duty is to <clears throat> reach out to uh, media such as yourself. And if, if we're able to contribute, such as this year, we had the spokesperson uh, Ned Price have a statement on camera. We had the Secretary of State, the first ever uh, sitting Secretary of State issue a statement on behalf of National Arab American Heritage Month. You mentioned uh, President Biden, of course, with his proclamation, which is uh, certainly, certainly very unique and much appreciated. I, I, I think we need to, I would like to give uh, credit to the this organization that I am part of that was able to push that out and able to garner attention and media and press focus and attention. And once that comes in, we're obviously delighted to, to speak about doing that throughout the department that was quite supportive. And if I can just add, I think having done a, uh, a statement on camera by the spokesperson this year, I think the major breakthrough was last year's statement on camera. Uh, I, you know, Nadia Zan is, is here, many members of our current board, board, including myself, we were able to push that through. We had lots of support last year within this administration, within the State Department, and we could not have done that without them. But again, the initiative has to be led by members of the community. So we, so we have to be, we have to be engaged. In other words, we have Absolutely. to be engaged. We have to stay in contact. Um, and but having you as Arab Americans in those roles makes it so much easier. You know, Mahmoud and Nadia are going to talk to a Ray Hanania most of the time. Um, a lot more easily than you might with someone else that, you know, that, you know, Ar Arab Americans, we kind of walk a, a very delicate line, you know, because of all the different conflicts and things. We we come from 22 different countries. Um, we have to be careful about how we do things. Um, so I, I assume that there's this little bit of a defense mechanism to make sure that the correct message goes out the proper way to everybody. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And the messaging that I think our community and uh, this board that uh, we've had the last couple of years, including Mahmoud, has really been focused on um, the kind of unity of the underrepresented groups, um, pushing for tangible 
um, changes at the department and outside the department that will really support all underrepresented groups so that those different voices at the table are heard. And when you know, when you have different people at the table, not just ethnicity wise, but disability wise uh, from different parts of America who went to different schools, you have more creative thinking at the table to solve these really major world issues. And, and then I think you have better policy that creates a stronger national security. And so I think the message I like to say is that Arab Americans are part of that fabric like at this organization and in foreign affairs organizations, it's not just about how we're different. It's about how we're contributing to the success of our country that, you know, it, whether you're immigrant or not, this is where your home is now. Right. So that's and what did I you, like. Did you have a lot of uh, Arab American predecessors uh, in state government? I mean, were there a lot? It seems that there are a lot more today. I mean, the president, this is the first president who initiated a partnership now, you know, whether you agree it's been strong enough or whatever, the point is he did it. Then I don't recall anybody else ever having a partnership with Arab Americans. That's the first time I think Arab Americans have been recognized in a significant way. Other, we've always been an offshoot of the Arab world and the Middle East. So this is significant. Did you guys as an affinity group play a role in defining that partnership or is that something that you do now? Let me see if Mahmoud wants to take this. If not, I'll just very quickly, okay. Mahmoud, please add. I think the Biden administration definitely has the most Arab American political appointees. I think where we come in is, is working on that recruitment effort and pushing the department to look at Michigan, talk to schools in California, Texas, those populations with greater Arab Americans. Also, we did two recruitment um, efforts this year, two uh, Facebook Lives with careers.state.gov where we talked about security clearances, where we talked about what kind of careers are at the department. So I think pushing on the recruitment side is where you've really seen more Arab Americans. And I, you know, I mean, we've had people like Ambassador Philip Habib in the 60s and 70s uh, who've had a huge impact on the department. But I think now not only are we having more Arab Americans, we're having a greater diversity of where those Arab Americans come from. Like you mentioned, the 22 countries. I want to see more diversity of that than just more of the, you know, um, I'm Syrian American, definitely heard of Syrian Americans who work in government before, but I really want to get out there and really empower those who come from the more underrepresented communities. Mahmoud, if you have anything you want to add. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the times are changing. Some of that is quite natural. I mean, look, look at uh, Arab American celebrities, for, for example. That's not a role that we play, but that natural inclination and that natural uh, liking and uh, existence in society is frankly something that benefits us and we benefit from. Uh, in terms of having a month dedicated to National Arab American Heritage Month, having that month dedicated, we're able to reach out to other organizations that exist similarly, for example, with Congress. We're able to reach out with colleagues who happen to also be Arab Americans working at the White House. I don't know to what extent did we have a similar amount or, or number of individuals or colleagues that were Arab Americans that also worked at the White House and uh, staffers from members of Congress and so forth. But we're able to work with them and through that partnership we're able to uh, frankly achieve a lot more but you're absolutely right ray uh, going back to the point a few minutes earlier we have to initiate and lead some of these efforts and thankfully we're able to benefit from those who came a little bit before us but also as times are changing and definitely there's a lot more diversity in the country that di that directly benefits us and we should utilize that to and not only push our cause but push our cause as americans uh in in this country yeah and I, i'll tell you the more we're seen at more levels that familiarity becomes a base to undermine fear to undermine misunderstanding you know i grew up watching movies where every terrorist looked like one of my uncles you know, and I'm sitting there, it's going to have an impact on you. And I, I think I was one of the first of only two or three uh, journalists to get hired by a mainstream daily newspaper in the 70s. It was really rare. And then, you know, to, but to live in an environment where we were viewed as a hostile, negative story, nobody would call me to ask about what happened in our community. They'd call me to say, what did you think of the terrorist act? overseas and I go what do I have to do with the terrorist act overseas cover my community do you find that there's a greater interest in what we're doing as Arab Americans 
Uh, was it hard? Was it hard for you to get hired by the administration back in 2014 as Arab Americans? I actually came into the government in, in 2011. I, you know, I would say I'm lucky in the way that I'm a third generation public servant. So my father immigrated uh, from Syria and worked uh, as a physician on a U.S. base in Georgia. And my grandfather immigrated and taught Arabic at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. So I think my fears of getting a security clearance, I guess I just didn't really think about them because I had a family who had them. I would say it's, it was hard at first not to get typecast into certain positions. And just because me and Mahmoud work on the Middle East does not does not mean that. Right. That's why you're restricted. You're not restricted to that. You're not restricted. I mean, you can work on any subject. And we need, like I said, diverse voices in every single uh, effort that the, that the government engages on. Um, I will, I agree with you totally that we're seeing Arab Americans in different parts of American culture and not just as bad guys in movies, which even when I was a kid, that was all I ever saw. I think that's twofold. I think that's the community saying we don't all have to be doctors and engineers, um, which is great. Yeah. All <laughs> my uncles, to- doctors, engineers. <laughs> I'm the black sheep. I became a journalist. Really, they looked at me like, what are you, Mejnoon? I said, no, I want to yeah. do something different. I don't like blood. I don't like surgery. I don't want to do that. He was like diplomacy. Yeah. <laughs> because you're you know, right. What's the right? Where our parents and grandparents come from, you know, it's not exactly a fair and free, transparent process to work in the government in some countries, not all. Um, so I think uh, we're diversifying what we look into as successful careers. I think, like you said, we see people in those careers, and you you can't see yourself in a career unless you see someone who looks like you. Right. And that you just don't think it's possible. And I think the other thing is like a lot of the generation coming into working in diplomacy and foreign affairs are a result of 9-11. And I think before that, a lot of us were able to pass as white or pass as Caucasian and 9-11 really pushed us to think about like, what is our role in this country? How do we want to push back against stereotypes? And and like, I'm proud of where I'm from and I want to contribute. So like, how do I do that? And how about you, Mahmoud, when, when you got in, involved? Yeah, um, it's it's quite quite similar. I'm uh, I'm an Egyptian American. I guess I would be ranked as a 1.5. So not a first gen uh, since I came as a child and uh, versus coming as, as an adult. And you know, graduated and through uh, dumb luck, I got uh, an internship to work at Al Jazeera TV that turned into a 16 year uh, career. But through that time, and, and, and 9-11 had obviously, had obviously taken place, unfortunately. Uh, through, through the time I found uh, lots of success there, but I also, as Nadia pointed out, I started working with the Department of State uh, through my work as, as, as a journalist, naturally, to uh, cover foreign policy in, uh, in the U.S. And you really did start to get inspired when you saw other individuals who maybe looked like you. Not, not a lot, but definitely there were many that looked like you, whether they're from the area or from Egypt or Muslim or not. That didn't matter. But we, what I started to sense is, uh, one, maybe I can do this. And two, um, maybe I can contribute um, just as others would. Uh, for for the sake of furthering my country and my policy, as as you both already said that we you know this is where we live, this is where we are, and so you kind of have that uh, uh, personal burden where you want to you know what I want to give back. This is the best way I can give back. I can be just as effective and influential as others. But more than that, I've got perhaps an advantage, cultural knowledge, uh, maybe it's the language uh, and its heritage. So all those together actually make us quite effective and, and efficient. So. Uh, you know, are we going to work on Middle East policy forever? Who who knows? I don't know. But this is where we envision ourselves. And so it has to come from the individual from within. My quest to come on board and join the State Department has not been easy. And it's not easy for everyone. So I, I it makes me appreciate the opportunity that much more that it was not that easy to get into this position. So uh, like like everyone else, uh, you know, I, I sought it out. And it, uh, it it is rewarding to be able to contribute on the inside so i hope that addresses what we're talking yeah no no listen i this is all new ground i'm going to tell you this is new ground and i think that the more people see us you me every listen to us i don't sound different you don't sound different uh we sound like everybody else i remember 
I, I served during the military during the Vietnam War, and I remember I was the only Arab in, at this F-111 base. And the commander said, oh, you're Arab? I said, well, I'm Arab American. I said, my right. mom's from Bethlehem. And right away, he kind of softened a little bit. Bethlehem <laughs> is a big deal. Pennsylvania, I said, no, no, Bethlehem, the Bethlehem. But he listened, you know, he saw me as a human being and then asked me, what did I feel about the 1973 war that had taken place in that October? So we can play a role just by being there, correct? Does the and, president and call you up and say, hey, um, can you tell me a little bit about should I get the uh, Warak Diwali or uh, Mashi, you know, or hummus? Or, yeah. or does, does he call you and ever ask you, you know, We're questions? Eight. Well, I don't know, maybe Nadia gets a call, but I, I, I will just chime in and say, you're absolutely right. I love the story. But uh, on, on, on a serious note, none of that happens had you not served. None of that happens Correct. if individuals mm -hmm. such as Nadia or myself or uh, many of the awesome individuals that are on our distribution list and members are not in the government. So without that, without a presence, it's really hard to not only have input, but it's really difficult to you know, be critical. How can you be critical when you're not even participating in, in, in the process? So, uh, you, no, you're absolutely right. But we have to initiate many of these many of these endeavors, initiatives. You have to be there at these locations, whether it's government or whether it's outside of government. So we understand and totally respect that, too. So the burden is on us as Arab Americans to be part of the system. Now, the door is would you say the door is open to us or is it more open? I would say um, it's the most open it's ever been. And we have some work to do on um, the way we retain those from underrepresented communities and, and really pulling more from our community. But I think the door is absolutely open if you are willing to take the risk that many of our families maybe don't love of getting into, you know, um, uh, foreign policy or government work. I would say absolutely. This well, we, is the come, we come from societies where it's a little bit different. Uh, foreign ser uh, government service is not the same as government service here. So right. we bring our experiences here and we kind of live physically in the United States, but mentally we're still back home. That's changed a lot, I think, with mm -hmm. the last few generations of uh, Arab Americans. And, uh, and of course, uh, I know that uh, you're going to ask President Biden if he'd be, you know, if he has a free moment to come on my radio show, I'd love to have him uh, come on. Listen, the last administration, I had to fight to get a question in at a press conference I was invited to. I had to yell and scream. And finally, they stopped and they looked at me and said, wow, an Arab American journalist. Yeah, I want to hear what he has to say, like I was some oddity. Um, I don't feel that today. I feel like there is a recognition of what we're trying to do. Journalism is journalism. News is news. Um, and now I feel that being Arab American doesn't disqualify me, you know, from doing some of the things that everybody else does. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think the president will come on my show? <laughs> How about the secretary of state? <laughs> That's above my pay grade. Ned, Ned Price. We'll get Ned Price, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, Mahmoud, I'm going to be bugging yeah. you now. Now that I know what you do and who you are, I'm going to be calling you all the time, begging for and asking for uh, comments and connections and You're stuff. You're more than but, welcome. Yeah, but that's, too, that's what it, I think. I think uh, the Arab American community is an untapped resource that can do a lot to help change the way we look at the Middle East here in this country and even support, you know, the peace effort to make things happen in, in a positive way. So to see you guys there makes me feel good that I know that your voices are going to be there to temper any of the, you know, years ago where things would just go off in a segue in, in, in the wrong direction. And I think you being there, you're kind of like giving direction, which I think is very important. I, and I know we're, we're really run out of time and I've really kept you a long time, but any final thoughts, um, comments that you'd either like to make, uh, um, Mahmoud, Nadia, either one. I, I, I would just say that, uh, yes, the initiatives have to be led by us as members in government or in private organizations or companies, but we're also fortunate. We're fortunate to have those who are willing to uh, listen. You gave the example of your personal life as well, and that contributes to it. But I think what 
uh, what organizations, whether it's the government or private companies need to see is that initiative from individuals. Hey, I want to push this cause. I want to have this initiative. Hey, this actually really matters to me, or this might not go over well in this community or organization. Once we're able to do that, I, I think we're more likely to experience a lot more success, but, uh, but that success is incumbent. Um, it is partially because of other individuals who are not Arab who have listened to us and supported us so much. So I, I just wanted to get that in there. Thank you. Nadia, any final comments or thoughts? Yeah, uh, very quickly, I think, you know, something my boss, the deputy secretary always says is to bring your whole self to work, bring your whole background, bring your, bring your whole ties, because that's what makes us stronger. I mean, as a nation, I mean, there's a, there's also a bunch of uh, writings about the business uh, argument for diversity. And so diversity and inclusion isn't something to do because it's good to do. It's because it makes us stronger and smarter. And I think that's something like we we just don't hear enough. And, and that diversity includes the Arab American community. And the only other thing I'll say is the coalition building between the other underrepresented groups within the State Department has just really skyrocketed of the changes that we've made. So I would really encourage the Arab American community with any initiatives they do to try and build coalitions with other groups. Might Thanks. I suggest one last thing before I let you go? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think it would be great if uh, you were to organize something with the Arab American media, because, you know, right now the media is kind of like isolated at the Arab American media. We get some reports, we get some news stories. Nobody really pays attention to us and that that creates kind of an extremism because mm -hmm. we tend to feel on the outside and then you feel like, oh, to get attention, you got to beat on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that opening that door would maybe help change the focus away from this 100 percent on politics to more of an understanding of our role as Americans in this country. So just my two cents is uh, uh, maybe a future member of the affinity group, you know, once right. I get thrown out of journalism at some we'll point. We'll take it back so. to the board. We're a democratic force. <laughs> yes, please do that. Listen, um, I want to thank my guest, uh, Nadia Farah. Uh, she is the special assistant to Deputy Sherm uh, Secretary Sherman covering the Middle East and North Africa, counterterrorism and cyber issues. And Mahmoud El Hamalawi, press officer in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, covering North Africa. Nadia is the chairperson and Mahmoud is a deputy chair, I believe, of the Foreign Affairs Agency's Employee Affinity Group for Arab Americans in the Department of State. That's a lot of director. words. Pardon me? Yep. Very Communi no, I'm the communications director of the organization. Communications director. See, you it's a new promote, thing. You got to promote it during this show. Well, there you go. See, now they're going to blame me, that Arab journalist giving promotions left and right honestly it was a real pleasure talking to both you and uh you i look forward to speaking with you guys again and uh you know hopefully uh, i do look forward to that uh interview with president biden when it can be arranged we'll be right. so thank you absolutely and happy Arab thank american you, heritage month and again yes. uh, very gracious of both of you to come on board and uh join us to talk to detroit uh tomorrow chicago canada where they can learn a lot about what we do in america and also in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much, you guys. Thank you so thank much. You. Happy Arab American Heritage Month. All right, Bye. you too. We'll talk to you later. You're listening to the Ray Hanania Show here in Detroit, in Washington, D.C., um, Canada. And uh, if it's Thursday in Chicago, 12 noon on WNWI AM 1080, you're listening to me there. Um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about a phenomenal series that was published in Arab News. I learned so much about uh, the Coptic Christian heritage from a deep dive that Arab News journalist Jonathan Gornal put together. And I'm also hoping that we're going to have author Abdul Latif El Manawi, who I did speak with last week. He's in Cairo, Egypt, um, to talk about his book about the uh, uh, Tahrir Square Revolution and the challenges facing Coptic Christians. I'm hoping he'll join us. But uh, when we come back, we'll have Jonathan Gornell with us talking about that deep dive. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. 
Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. In a perfect world, everyone would be a perfect driver. Hands at nine and three, everyone. Nine and three. Everyone would follow all the rules. Please go ahead and merge. I'll make room. Thank you, fellow driver. And nothing unexpected would ever happen. Even the squirrels would know the right time to safely cross the road. In this perfect world, you wouldn't have to wear a seatbelt. But in case you hadn't noticed, we don't live in a perfect world. About a thousand people in Michigan die each year in vehicle crashes, and thousands more are injured. Wearing your seatbelt reduces your risk of death in a crash by 45% in a car and by 60% in a pickup truck. So until we find a perfect world to drive in, make our imperfect world safer by buckling up. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. Imagine you're on a train track. Somewhere miles away, a train is headed your way. You can't see it yet, but it's coming. Slowly but surely. If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may be on the wrong track, and diabetes could be heading your way. Bit by bit, the danger is getting closer and closer. So should you stay on the track you're on now or move to make a change and reduce your risk? If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may qualify for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in your local community. This one-year program could be the ongoing support you need to put you on the right track. Not only did participants lose weight, they cut their risk of type 2 diabetes in half. Ready to get on board for a healthier future? Learn more about the National Diabetes Prevention Program and what else you can do to manage and prevent diabetes at michigan.gov diabetes. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji. And at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you. And I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F. Or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. The Ray Hanania Show is brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News Newspaper, the Middle East leading English language publication with print and online editions in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, France, Japan, Pakistan, England, and the United States. Listen to live radio every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and Ontario, Canada. Or watch the live broadcast on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. The Ray Hanania Show is rebroadcast in Chicago at 12 noon on Thursday. For more information on the radio stations, live Facebook broadcast, and podcasts, visit ArabNews.com. And now, here's your host, columnist and U.S. special correspondent for Arab News, Ray Hanania. And welcome back to the Ray Hanania Show here at uh, the U.S. Arab Radio Network, sponsored by Arab News at ArabNews.com. Uh, in this segment, we're going to look at Coptic Christians of Egypt with Jonathan Gornell, who, is, who works with the Arab News Research Unit. He's a British journalist, formerly with The Times, and he's lived and worked in the Middle East and is now based in the U.K. He specializes in health, a subject on which he writes for the British Medical Journal and others. He did this phenomenal deep dive into the Coptic Christians of Egypt. Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Ray. Good to be you, here. You think I was too hard at demand, you know, pushing for an interview with uh, President Biden with the two State Department people? Not at all. You must go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. You, get I, you know, I, there's a fear of Arabs in the United States. I don't know if it's and I don't get that sense <laughs> when I've been to London or the UK as oh. deep as it is in this country. 
No, we have we have as many Arabs in London as we have was, anyone from anywhere else. But... I, I did a comedy show at that big uh, auditorium in London about uh, maybe about eight years ago with 12,000 Arabs and Muslims in the audience. I'd never <laughs> seen an audience. The biggest one I ever had was in uh, Toronto, which was at the uh, uh, Thompson Center, and it was 2,500 people. But to see 12,000 <laughs> Arabs who understood what I was saying, that was phenomenal. So, I, yeah, I love London, and I hope I get a chance to come out there to meet you. To, sure. um, tell, I, I'm afraid we may not have Abdul Latif El Manawi, who's the author of uh, some great writing. And uh, I, I did speak to him. He wanted to be on. I'm not sure what happened. But, Jonathan, the floor is all yours. Tell us about the Coptic Christians, the deep dive that you did. It was very fascinating. You know, well, their story. I, the, 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 that is the word, fascinating. I mean, <clears throat> the, the story of the, the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria, to give it its correct name, is, is simply an epic story. And I think it's one that, that isn't really appreciated by many people, certainly outside Egypt. I think right. in Egypt, there's a great familiarity with the, the Coptic presence. Um, but at the same time, um, the, the, the Coptic story... Uh, it, it starts at the very beginning of the Christian story. I mean, according to the scriptures, um, Mary and Joseph fled from uh, Judea because of the massacre of the innocents ordered by King Herod uh, to save the, the life of the infant Jesus. And they, they took refuge in Egypt. So that's, that's kind of when Christianity came to Egypt. But very hard on their heels came Mark the Evangelist, who founded the Church of Alexandria, in Alexandria, in Egypt, <clears throat> the ancient city, um, and it all grew from there. So we're talking about 65 years uh, Anno Domini, um, so it's one of the earliest Christian churches, and it became and, one of the great five C's of Christianity. And um, Mark was one of the disciples, I believe, of Jesus, wasn't he? Or he didn't, was that... No, he, he, he was an evangelist. Um, he, Who followed. He after exactly he followed the word and um and and of course it, it began for him as it continued for the cops in uh, throughout the, the next two two millennia uh with martyrdom because saint mark as he became uh, was martyred by a pagan mob on the streets of alexandria and i'm afraid that the cops have experienced over, over the millennia a beginning lot of with the, the romans martyrdom seemed to be their lot a lot of persecution. Oh, it the Diocletian, like... uh, the Emperor Diocletian, they, they actually date their calendar from the era of, era of what they call the Diocletian uh, persecution because it was such a traumatic event. Um, but the, you know, the fascinating thing about the Copts, and I found this when I interviewed um, Archbishop Angelos in uh, the UK. He's the, the London uh, Archbishop. They are so resilient and if if i've never never met any religious people who so personify the turn the other cheek <laughs> uh, that, that's what they do i mean you, when you look at this the terrible things that have occurred in in egypt to them at the hands of you know um islamist extremists and in libya at the hands of daesh um they've never responded with violence Right. And I, I asked I asked the Archbishop about that. And he said, well, <laughs> he said, we didn't have to send out a memo from head office. Don't respond with violence. People just didn't. You know, they just they it, turned the other cheek. It's, it's they, fascinating, too, isn't it? How uh, martyrdom actually creates the movement that mm -hmm. the people who take the life of the person believe that they're trying to stop. Mm -hmm. That his martyrdom kind of launched this, didn't it? Uh, Marx. Well, it's interesting. Again, the Archbishop spoke about. I mean, you remember the her the horrendous scenes in uh, in Libya in 2015. Yes, when, right. When tw twenty cops and their Ghanaian colleague were were kidnapped and executed on a beach in in Libya, um, and it was filmed. And you know, it was supposed to it was supposed to be an iconic moment for Daesh. You know, attacking this the, the Christian church in Egypt. Um, but actually, it, it, it had the opposite effect. You know, more people went to church, <laughs> more people responded to the religion right. and, and to the, you know, to the 
to the humanity of the religion. That's that's the for me the most impressive thing that these people find humanity in in the depths of inhumanity. Extremely yeah, and I, I always have to explain to Americans, especially American Christians, that yeah, there you know there are there are acts of violence like this one we were just talking about. Um, it's not because of Islam or Muslims. It's because of extremists, exactly. and the extremists commit these acts. But Coptic, and I and I was going to ask you about the Coptic Christians. Do they feel comfortable in the Muslim world the way a lot of Christian groups? I mean, we do feel comfortable. I, I always tell people I'm Christian by religion, but I'm Muslim by culture. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel a part of that life. Do they feel that way, too? Or is there a deeper divide between them and uh, uh, Islam? Well, I think these days, especially um, less and less so. But I wouldn't have ever said that that was the case originally, because, you yeah, know, the, these these people would describe themselves as the original Egyptians. I mean, right. they, they predate Islam, um, you know, Islam, um, the, the, the Arab world invaded and took over Egypt in, you know, the seventh century, um, by which time these, that faith had been operating there for 600 years. Um, so and not only operating there, but had its roots in, in the Pharaonic Egypt, in the Coptic language, which is now pretty much reduced to just the you know the, the liturgies of the church do they speak um, it at all or uh, well, the, the Catholic today that's part of the deep dive we've done um it's interesting that many cops today do not speak coptic but it is spoken in churches and in even in look the cops went around the world there were about an estimated two million now Right. Very big in America, in Canada, in Europe, in, in the UK, Australia, wherever they go, their churches thrive and they hold their services in English, in Arabic, and in Coptic. Wow. Um, and in a way, those that's that's the sort of the diagram which describes these people. They belong to all those cultures. They they are as as much Egyptian as they are Christian. And they don't preclude themselves from Egyptianness because they're not Muslim, and they don't preclude Muslims from their society because they're not Christians. So it's an extraordinary situation. I mean, I think there are about 15 million Copts in Egypt now, which is about roughly 10 percent of the population. Well, um, and, and that would be the majority of Coptic Christians, because I know there's some in the U.S., but I don't see a lot of them. I do remember when the, they have a pope, I believe. Oh, yes. um, who yeah, visited yeah. Uh, Chicago. Yeah. Um, and uh, it wasn't a big community. Is that like that in London or are Coptic uh, Christians really they they seem to be attached to their original homes? Completely. You know, in Egypt, they haven't Com- left completely. I, I, I interviewed a, 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 a really interesting guy called Fadi Mikhail, who's um, he was born in the UK. Um, he was born in Harlow in Essex, which is actually where I went to study journalism many, many years ago. His family came from Egypt. Like many cops, uh, they emigrated. And, and it's not they don't emigrate through fear or because of persecution. But like any people, they, they seek a better life for their families. And for many years in Egypt, the truth is, is that cops hit glass ceilings in professions. So the, the UK coptic community they're nearly all doctors you know <laughs> they they came over, over to the uk to pursue their careers and so they they have this very well educated community um but and fadi who is he was born here he he's so attached to his egyptian roots as well as his coptic roots that he um he studied as an iconographer and now he's he's famous the world over for painting these amazing icons that you see in Coptic churches, but at the same time, he has a parallel career as an artist in in the Western style. So, you know, nobody better personifies that bridge between cultures and generations as Fadi Mukal. I I, I really recommend that people look him up because his work is tremendous, whether it's icons or or Western art. It really is something. I know when we talk about Arab Christians, they talk about how it's uh... Uh, been reduced in size the population is left in the middle east area they've fled they've they're left they're gone to other for opportunities uh they've fled the way many people have fled violence or whatever 
Um, but it seems like the Coptic Christians, they must be the majority of Christians left in the Middle East. I, they got to be the largest Christian population uh, that I know of in the Middle East. I, I, I don't know for sure, but that sounds almost certainly certainly right. I have to say, and I think that it, it by itself is is a sort of testament to their not yeah. just their resilience because they have had some terrible times. I mean, 2017 series of, of outrages against themselves and their their churches and their buildings, hundreds killed, um, and of course 2015 we saw. But in many ways now, I think they've endured for 2,000 years suffering and martyrdom is part of their psyche but i wouldn't i i wouldn't for a moment suggest that they're in any way victims or, or they don't even regard themselves as a minority because right. they they're egyptians and that's it as far as they're concerned and they don't regard themselves as victims at all you know? was it difficult to get the coptic community to open up to talk about all this or was it welcoming for them to be able to talk about themselves? Interesting. I think more so um, the the Coptic community overseas, the the emigrant uh, uh, community. But the, these these guys have their their feet very much still in Egypt. You know, they go home twice a year, three times a year to see family, or even just a holiday. They are drawn to Egypt. This is their homeland. They'll they'll never leave their homeland in their heart at least and they'll most of them visit and go back and forth you know they don't i think the problem is is that we really one interesting fact that emerged when we were looking at this you know you you'll be familiar with the american green card um lottery as it's called yes um which was introduced uh, in order to sort of encourage immigration to america from areas where it wasn't that common previously for many years, Egypt has been at the very top of the league table of applications for these passes. Um, it's difficult to, to separate you know, who it is, whether it's cops or whether it's other Egyptians. But the reality is that when offenses have taken place against the, uh, the cops or, or when there's been a big Islamist surge in the politics in, in Egypt, then the numbers have shot up you know, to over a million in a, in a year, you know, when, especially after 2017, since uh, Sisi became president, um, the number of applications has steadily fallen, which I, I find quite fascinating. And, I, and it's not a coincidence. It's because his government has reached out to the cops constantly with not just with gestures. I mean, OK, he turned up on uh, right. to to celebrate in the, in the cathedral at Christmas and to make a speech about one, one Egypt, one Republic, doesn't matter what faith you are, which of course all the cops appreciated very much. But you know, when, when the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the workers were killed in, in Egypt, he immediately, the day after, sent the Egyptian Air Force to wreak, you know, vengeance. To respond, the, right. Yeah, absolutely. To show and that then, he was concerned about it. Well, it was a demonstration that you know, you are our people, you are Egyptian, you know, and that really struck home, I think, with the Coptic community. And then a church was built where the martyrs' remains were finally interred when they were, re re and it was paid for by the state, that church, you know. And these things aren't widely appreciated, but they're happening all the time. And, and I spoke to, as I said, to Archbishop Angelos, and he said that, you know, <clears throat> gestures are all very well, um, <clears throat> the cops aren't stupid, you know, they, they understand politics. Right. But he said, this is more than just gestures. Things are happening. For many years, cops couldn't legally build churches, and now they can. So they're feeling embraced, I think, more than ever by the Egyptian state. Well, we only have a few minutes left, Jonathan, that, but although I, I want to urge everybody to go to ArabNews.com and look at the deep dive dive on the Coptic Christians by uh, Jonathan Gornell and his staff, uh, the research unit. They did a great job, I think. Um, I was going to ask about a little bit about politics. It seems to me that they tend to shy away from politics uh, in the Arab world. And I wonder if that was the case, like during the revolution at Tahrir Square, did they kind of, they were treated better, I think, by, or at least in their eyes, by governments 
you know, in the Arab world. So maybe they're less uh, fighting for, you know, the same things that the protesters were fighting for. Or is that just a stereotype? You know, were they, do we know if they were involved at all or? It's interesting. I think um, with with the, the uprising in 2011, there were the, there have been a number of um, uh, offenses against the Copts before the general uprising. And so at the time, everything became rather blurred. Um, but I think you're correct in, in thinking that the Copts have always it's not a cynical stance, right. but I think they've they've always tried, they've always seen the long game, and the long game isn't to get involved with right. this political position or that political, you know, people come and go, right? We had Sadat, we have Mubarak. We, you know, none of these, none of these people are going to be good wholeheartedly. I mean, even going back, I mean, let's let's remember that um, you know, when NASA and the free officers movement took over in, in the 50s. That was when the, the, the Coptic emigrations began. That's how right. the, the Copts ex have expressed themselves over the years. Right. They leave, you know. And, and I have they're to leaving, say, it's probably not a strong, good environment for them. No, that's when, why they're leaving, of course. Yeah. But, 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 far, but they don't throw bombs. You right. know, they don't shoot people. They don't set fire to stuff. They just go. And, and I think ultimately that's quite sad for Egypt because yeah. many of the people who are leaving who are cops are obviously, you know, the, some of the brightest people uh, in Egypt. And, uh, and I think uh, now we have a situation where, you know, Angelos is saying that, uh, you know, he believes that under El Sisi, cops are being seen more than ever now as uh, equal partners in, in an Egypt built by all Egyptians, to, to quote the precedent. So, uh, and I, can I just quote him? He says, he says, there's a well-known hypothesis that a nation with freedoms and respects, respect for all its people is a successful nation because it draws on the gifts and the abilities of all its people. Um, so the more Egypt becomes all-encompassing, all-embracing, the more we will see a thriving nation and, and everyone will benefit from that. I want to thank our guest, Jonathan Gornell, who is with the Arab News Research Unit. Um, he's a journalist there. He did a great job. Again, I'd urge you to go to ArabNews.com, read the uh, deep dive that he did into Coptic Christians of Egypt. It is fascinating. I learned a lot about it uh, from reading it. So he did a great job, and it really is very impressive. So um, I'm just sorry that we weren't able to get Abdul Latif al Manawi. Uh, on the show with us but uh, if I can you know reschedule him I'll do that and I'd love to bring you back on so that maybe we can have a conversation with him too Fantastic. Jonathan thank you again so much for joining us I appreciate it thank and you, I want to thank everybody out there in Radio Land for tuning in to the Ray Hanania show here in Detroit in Washington DC in Canada uh, and of course for those people in Chicago who uh, might be listening on Thursday uh, 12 noon on AM 1080, uh, the rebroadcast. And of course, you can always go to Facebook at, at facebook.com slash Arab News. You'll find this interview, uh, the today's show uh, live, or, uh, in, sorry, in broadcast streaming broadcast on the Facebook page and also at ArabRadio.us. I'm Ray Hanania. Please uh, visit ArabNews.com, read our stories, read my columns, read uh, about what's happening in the Arab world. It's the best place to get information on what's going on. Jonathan, you have a great week and everybody out there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and we will talk to you next week when we will be talking about uh, Arab Americans fighting against discrimination in Chicago against the mayor. We have one of the aldermen that's fighting with her uh, about how she mistreats Arab Americans. So we'll have that next week. You guys have a great day. Jonathan, again, thank you for joining us. And I want to thank everybody from uh, Nadia Farah and uh, uh, also Mahmoud uh, Al-Hamalawi for uh, joining us uh, earlier in the show. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.